Welcome to the Rick Helps Real Estate Show. We are going to talk about the Arizona and Western United States water crisis. It is definitely a crisis. You can't talk about growth, housing, everybody moving to Arizona, and not mention water. We've reached a critical point in our water availability. Now, our water, all of us on the West get it from the Colorado River. And the states that share that are Colorado, Utah, Nevada, California, Arizona, and parts of New Mexico. The problem is there's not enough snowpack in the Rocky Mountains, and there hasn't been for a few decades. And now if we do get good snowpack, it soaks into the ground and it is not making it into the river at the rate that it once did. By the time you get down to Mexico, there isn't the Colorado River. There hasn't been for quite some time. In fact, if you go to Yuma, you can wade right across the giant Colorado River. There's no river there. It's a creek. So the once raging Colorado, after having two dams put on it to help us generate power and to serve the needs of all those Western states, they're now drying up. So what does Arizona actually use out of the Colorado River? Let's start there. Arizona uses approximately 7 million acre feet of water each year from all sources, about 2.8 of which comes from the Colorado River. Of our Colorado River water, about 1.5 acre feet moved through the Central Arizona project in canals. And if you've been down here in Phoenix, you can see those canals. In the metro areas of Phoenix and Tucson, the rest is used along the river primarily for agriculture in Yuma. Now, it's saying here that Lake Mead is the reservoir that supplies Arizona's water from the Colorado River, and the region has suffered from a long-term drought. This here is Lake Powell. This is Glen Canyon Dam up in Lake Powell on the Arizona-Utah border. You can see how low that water level is right there. And Lake Powell is what feeds Lake Mead. And Lake Mead, my friends, could not be looking any worse. Lake Mead has pipes underneath it that they use to give uh, pull the water in for Las Vegas and for Arizona. And they've had two levels. When the water level dropped, they put another pipe through the mountain into the lake to pull the water. Now they put the third one in down below. If the water level drops below that third pipe, there's no water. Not only that, they consider that dead pool, neither one of these dams are going to be generating electricity for about 4 million people. And this is about as bad as it gets. Again, this is Lake Powell not Lake Mead. Lake Powell is the one that if Lake Mead goes down, we get to feed it, feed Lake Mead from Lake Powell. And this is how far down Lake Mead is as of today. Las Vegas is very good at recycling the water. They, uh, I think they're at about a 60% rate. Of all the cities in the United States, Las Vegas is number one when it comes to using water and recycling and putting it back in the lake. Um, Arizona, not so much. The problem is uh, we use a lot of water, as does California, for farmland. It uses far more water than houses. So I want to take a look at some of the ways in which Arizona is saving water and trying to, and uh, some of the ways that we are not. Most of the East Valley is made up of new housing developments like this one in Gilbert and they're everywhere. Where I'm walking right now used to be farms, cows, cotton fields, a lot of agriculture. And so I asked the uh, city, he's actually a gentleman that worked for the water department in Mesa. And I said, how are you managing the water in all these new developments that we have out here? He said, well, ironically, when you look at the homes that are built, and they're built on farmland, we're actually using less water than we did when they were farms. 
and he said so a new housing development that comes in on a, replaces a bunch of farms especially cotton farms that are notorious for their water usage he says the overall water usage drops so that begs the question but what about east of here Apache Junction where they're planning on putting that development that's going to have a million people living in it over time he said well that's going to be a problem because whereas before we were taking houses and replacing farms and the water consumption is less now you're putting houses where there's no water being used you're putting houses in the desert and he said they're going to have to find the water and i don't know how they're going to do it Behind me is the Chandler Intel plant. It's going through a major $7 billion expansion. There's cranes everywhere. This is the major employer for the city of Chandler. Here's a fun number for you. They use 9 million gallons of water a day here. Now, that's a staggering, staggering number, but I was talking to one of the city managers uh, for Chandler, for Chandler Water in particular, and I said, man, how do they handle all that water? I thought somebody was hollering at me there for a second. Where do we get all this water for the Intel plant? He goes, I said, they use 9 million gallons a day. And his answer was, he goes, no, they borrow it. The Intel plant takes the water from the city of Chandler and they purify it because they use the water to rinse off their chips, take all the impurities off their chips. Which it's still amazing me, you need a building that big to make something that small. But they use the water to spray off these chips, and then after they've purified it, then it goes into another treatment facility that's about a mile from here that costs about a billion dollars, and they're building another one. And the water gets purified again because they take out the impurities that they washed off the chips. This water is now rinsed of all its impurities and everything guess where it goes right back into the aquifers in Chandler not all of it I think they're somewhere I read about 80 percent so the water goes back into our uh, system here down in uh, Chandler and they're building a new plant uh, Taiwanese plant up in North Phoenix my guess is they're probably gonna do about the same thing behind me here are some waterways in fact uh, here in Ocotillo, they have about 27 miles of water on around this golf course and this development. And you look at it and go, what a waste, all that water. Well, it's part of the water reclamation pro process for the city of Chandler. This water is put down here to break down even further in the sun. So it's pumped in and pumped back out and sent back to water treatment facilities. So this is part of the water treatment process here in this city. Another topic of discussion is green grass. Many developments like this in Ocotillo and Chandler, they require you to have winter grass and summer grass. Now a lot of cities across the Southwest are putting together programs where they give you relief and ask you to remove your grass and turn it to desert scape. Or a lot of people are starting to put in synthetic grass and we're starting to see that more and more because it does take a lot of water to maintain a lawn. Now you can see here, this has been replaced with synthetic grass. Now that we've taken just kind of a quick look at how some cities are managing their water, let's take a look at some data and show where we actually are, where our water's coming from and how it looks historically and just how dire is this situation. So here's one that's just a few facts on our water supply, and I'm going to take myself out of this. It says, <clears throat> Arizona is currently below 1957 water usage levels due to the increased conservation methods and the decrease in water used for agriculture. Like I talked about in the East Valley, homes replaced agriculture, and the net net is we're using less water. We have five times more water stored than we use and has never mandated municipal or residential restrictions throughout our state's history. However, on Monday, August 16th, 
of last year, U.S. officials declared the first ever water shortage from the Colorado River that will cause Arizona to take an 18% cut starting this year. This will not impact municipal or residential users. But it goes on to say that, and this is where a lot of people talking about Arizona water question this fact. Arizona has a multifaceted portfolio of water supplies with the most advanced program for managing groundwater in the country. Our vast aquifers allow us to access water during times of drought, and we've been prepared for decades for these kinds of shortages. While that may be true, that doesn't explain some of the things you're seeing like in pine and strawberry up uh, just north of Payson where wells are going dry. Um, so it goes on to say that only 36% of the Arizona water supply is from the Colorado River. So that's a good thing. So if we're getting an 18% cut, we may not feel that at all. But most of this is all boils down to conservation and, um, and then water management. And so we haven't even begun to talk about where we can find more water. And the Bureau of Reclamation here did a study. And they just had this. They just had a presentation and said, as of July 10th, here's the storage that we have. Lake Powell's 28% full, Lake Mead 27, total system storage 35%. And it's going down. But if we look at the snowpack, and this is what's interesting, the snowpack was 90% of normal. And that snowpack, although it was 90% of normal, because we've had a few years where it hasn't been normal, the ground is so dry that most of the, I mean, most of the snowpack made it to the Colorado, but not as much as we needed. It's soaked into the ground. So it's encouraging to see that the snowpack had a good year and it was up. However, we're not feeling it. We're not seeing it show up in the river. Lake Powell and Lake Mead, end of water year shortage. Take a look at this. The, these lines on the right are showing where we're going to be at the end of the year. But go back to 1964. Looks like we've seen this movie before. We had very low levels back in 1964. 1969, combined storage was 25.5 maximum, 49% of capacity. It goes on and on with more charts, more diagrams, and analysis of how much water is being used and where it's available. Now, groundwater has been uh, quite the discussion for a long time, aquifers, aquifers, what they're called. Um, if we're in a drought situation, they're, they're saying that we have, the state says that we have a hundred year supply of water in the aquifers. Um, I won't be around to see how that pans out, but you still see different parts of the state like Prescott that's having some water emergencies, Pine Top, Strawberry, little community called New River. And as I stated earlier, that new development, that area that uh, they eventually say will house a million people, you're not replacing farmland with houses. You're putting houses in the desert. They've got to get their water somewhere. As we look to try and find solutions for our water shortages by using conservation and new technologies, we also have to keep in mind that as we focus on the Colorado River, losing its uh, source and the water's being drained out of it and we're just not getting it replenished enough. There's also another little hidden thing going on out there in the rural areas. And that is that mega farms and deeper wells are draining the water beneath rural Arizona quietly and irreversibly. And that's kind of a scary thing. What we're seeing is that the wells are getting deeper and deeper in these same underground aquifers that uh, people are saying, give us a hundred year supply really aren't. As these wells go deeper and deeper, they're draining what would normally go into our aquifers and have all that nice water storage. And those don't get replaced by a couple of years of good rain. So what do we do? Well, the governor, state of Arizona, <coughs> has proposed spending $1 billion from the state's general fund over the next three years to help secure Arizona's water future for the next 100 years. 
In his final State of the Union address, the governor said the budget he sends to lawmakers will prioritize water infrastructure, including desalinization. What he's proposing with this billion dollars spent over three years is not just doing the research to get a desalination plant going. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But to come up with other solutions and other technologies, other solutions, other water sources, and let the private sector try and find something for us in conjunction with um, our government to find solutions because conservation is just not going to do it all by itself. Now, the desalinization plants, uh, Israel's had one for years and uh, they're, they produce a lot of water. Um, there's some <coughs> environmental pitfalls and questions with those. Um, we're looking at uh, working with the uh, people in Mexico and the Sea of Cortez down by Puerto Penasco, Rocky Point, and putting a desalination plant south of there that will pump water into a reservoir in Yuma. And then that water will be shared, uh, help make up for Mexico's drought because the Colorado River doesn't flow there anymore, and then provide some water for us. Now, it won't solve the entire water shortage. Question on desalination, environmental concerns, it's this brine that results, the coastline damage. I mean, that, that, that has to be a concern. Yeah, it, uh, people talk about generally about the brine that's pushed back into the water. Yes. And they talk also about the high energy usage to, to purify that water, to push the water through that, that metaphorical cheesecloth. Um, in fact, if you, are, if you are in a place that has dams that are damming up rivers that are going into the waterways, that is far more uh, effective, uh, affecting salinization, it's called the salting of the, of the seas than is desalination. Desalination adds a teeny bit of extra salt to the water, mm -hmm. but the water is very vast and it doesn't, measurement wise, it really doesn't significantly change. If there are environmental concerns that should not be ignored. Okay, so it's part of the plan, uh, but in Arizona, we got we water concerns and they're not going away anytime soon. Agriculture in Arizona takes up about three quarter of our, of our water supply. Does that make sense to you? Does that ring true to you? But with, with, I'll tell you what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. I think that agriculture is an essential part of every society. It helps to balance the society. Plus, it gives rural life as an important part of life. We can't all live in skyscrapers all over the place. And we need to have food, and we need to have food that's grown locally. So that is not something that I question. What I do question is the use of, tech, of technologies, you can't even call it technology, of methods that are 5,000 years old, like flood irrigation. For example, in Arizona, 89% of your irrigated fields are irrigated with flood irrigation. Now we talked about desalination. Let me tell you what flood irrigation means. It means that you use a, techn a technique, a method. Back from 5,000 years ago when the Egyptians were flooding the Nile Delta and they would grow crops and then after the, the water would evaporate out, they would flood it again and then again and again until finally it would go to harvest. But well, we are still using that same technique around the world, 600 million acres, 837,000 of them here in Arizona. That is what should stop. And the technology exists to transform Arizona to use about half as much water. And that savings, that savings of that water would answer all the tier one and all the tier two cuts imaginable. As opposed to flood irrigation, what are you talking about? A sprinkler, shower, I mean, no, the, the rolling a, thing? There's, there's, it's, a, it's a new kind of drip irrigation and I have- I Drip have, irrigation. And it's a kind of drip irrigation that's gravity fed. It uses no external energy. It's inexpensive to install. And to so there's no doubt that I'm not being honest and honorable about this, is that I do have an involvement with the company. I'm, I've recently, because I'm so excited by this technology, I recently volunteered to become their chief sustainability officer. It's a company called Endrip, mm -hmm. and this Endrip technology, like New Drip, this Endrip technology, it, 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 it saves about half of the water. It increases the farmer's yield by as much as a third. It cuts the fertilizer use by half. It cuts carbon emissions by as much as eighty percent. Is it expensive? No, it's it's about it's about twenty percent as expensive as classic pressurized drip. Where is it being used? Well, it's being used already in the crit farms. It's being used in in, uh, in Tonopah on a bunch of farms that are that working in coordination with the Central Arizona Project is being put on fields. But I'll make a prediction, and I hope you'll have me back in a year or two. Mm. I'll make a prediction that you'll be seeing this on hundreds of thousands of acres of Arizona farmland within five years. Okay, because right now groundwater concerns are big here. I mean, we have a, a Groundwater Management Act that's teetering, it seems like, after 40, 40 years. 40 years, 42 uh, years. Yeah, because, uh, because of the drought and, and the Colorado River supply and the whole nine yards. 
So we're looking for answers. Desalination obviously is, is a bit of an outlier. It exists, but we're still looking for answers. Think Arizona's going to make it as far as water is concerned? You know, I think I, I think you will because again, I've, I wrote a book called "Let There Be Water" about Israel's story. Israel, like Arizona, is a very dry place. It's gone through extraordinary population and economic growth. And in Israel, for those of you who have been, those of your viewers who have been there, know that you when you go there, you sort of feel like you're in London or New York. It feels water abundant, and that's because they have systematically utilized technologies of many kinds, not just one kind. They have an all of the above strategy where they look to say, how can we make our water as effective as possible so that people can live their lives normally and happily? And that could be the future of Arizona too. It takes smart governance, market forces, and lots of technology. Good conversation, Seth Siegel. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Ted. Thanks for having me. The fact that there's money being spent to try and find an answer is a good thing, but the wheels of government move slowly. So conservation has to be on everybody's mind and something that we should probably be doing before somebody mandates our water cuts. And there's a lot of different ways that we can save our water consumption at home.